in a destructive cult, there are always, always is a strong, charismatic leader. This woman formed her dangerous cult in the early 70s. Terry Hoffman attracted hundreds of Dallas members. Since that time, 11 of her followers, including this former SMU professor and his wife, the string of deaths started in January of 1977 when Glenn Cooley overdosed on drugs. In 79, Devereaux Cleaver drowned. Sandy Cleaver's car went over a cliff. Jill Bounds was murdered. Robin Lynn Ottstock, Mary Levinson, and Richard Hoffman left everything in their wills to Terry Hoffman. It's frightening. Today I want to talk about Terry Hoffman. This case is insane. At least 10 people died. There are more or potentially more. And many people think that Terry is responsible for their deaths. She's never been charged with their deaths though. So some people are saying that she's like a serial killer that pretty much got away with it. it, it it's insane and it's so weird. So I want to do what I usually do on my channel, which is I want to give you guys the facts. Then we'll discuss the theories and then you can decide for yourself. So the whole thing started on January of 1990 when neighbors in a fancy neighborhood in Dallas, Texas smelled this horrible, awful, nasty, putrid odor. They said it smelled like rotting garbage and it was coming from the Goodman's home. Their dogs were acting really weird. They were pacing in the front yard for weeks. And then that combined with the smell, they were like, oh my God, something horrible must have happened. So they call uh, the cops. When the first responders arrived, they tried to break into the home. When they knocked the door down, the smell that hit them was so bad that two of them ran back to the front yard, threw up, had to get gas masks just to go back inside the house. And when they went inside the house, it was horrible. First, it was just bugs everywhere. And they were following the little of the trail of the bugs and it led to the garage. They go in the garage and they see, first thing they notice is like, it's been rigged into a makeshift like gun range. Like they had target practice things everywhere and bullets and shell casings. And then they realize that there are two dead bodies there. Glenda and David Goodman were dead. Their bodies had been decomposing for so long. It was later determined that they were there for five weeks and they each had a gun near their bodies. Like there were two guns. And then there was this notebook at their feet, as well as an alarm clock. They would later determine that this was like a weird ritualistic double suicide. They couldn't tell, however, if one had shot the other and then shot themselves or if they both shot each other or themselves at the same time like they didn't know exactly how it happened but they knew that they both wanted to die and they planned this and they they died willingly everyone in the neighborhood was shocked because glenda and david seemed like they had it all and so it was like why why would they do this and why did no one find out for weeks like no one came to visit them to check up on them it was really strange well the notebook had all the answers this video is sponsored by every plate every plate is actually under the umbrella of hello fresh but it's so much cheaper it's actually 25 percent cheaper than grocery shopping but they're not sacrificing on quality ingredients what they do is everything comes with pre-portion and it helps you save on money and reduce food waste you know what i mean like when you have that old bag of spinach or lettuce or if you're me it's limp carrots and rotten blueberries because i overbuy i underuse and i end up wasting food i love making these meals for myself when i'm busy and i cook exactly what i want it's so fast and easy and so delicious what helps keep the price down is that the meals are simple they come together in just six steps and they're ready in around 30 minutes or less which is great if you're busy you have school you have work or maybe you're just lazy what's wrong with that and now you can get exactly what you want because you can swap things like proteins and sides you can add a protein you can even have a veggie veggie a veggie dish that you add different things to basically you customize it to your liking and it's really quick and easy so 
If you're interested, get your first box for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code NUR149. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal on your first box by going to everyplate.com and entering the code NUR149. That is up to a $110 value. Thank you so much to Every Plate for supporting my channel and back to the video. It was bizarre. It told a tale of a spiral into madness. David and Glenda had come to believe that they had been reincarnated 800,000 times. They used to be Adam and Eve, and now they said they were Jupiter and Venus. And they were fighting a war, a spiritual war against the Black Lords. Okay, now we're going to get into the Black Lords later, but uh, they were losing. In the notebooks, it, they felt like they were losing the spiritual war against the Black Lords. They were becoming increasingly more and more isolated. They were not talking to their family, their kids, and the reason why is because they cut them off because they said that they were stealing their energies. Where were they getting this from? Well, the notebooks that they left, their diaries said that they got it from their God, Terry Hoffman. They also wrote in these notebooks that they had given Terry a lot of money in their life. And also they wanted to give her 50% of everything they owned after their deaths, quote, forevermore. One thing you're going to see here is that almost everyone who died was very wealthy. Okay. And they all end up leaving their money to Terry Hoffman interesting then it was revealed that david and glenda were part of terry's group or cult uh, conscious development not only were they both members but terry is the one who introduced them to each other she also married them the diaries revealed a lot they talked about white pills that terry gave them and how they went into this deep trance-like meditation and saw the purple realm so the purple realm is a crystal city and they have a home there in this crystal city and they talked about a meditation that terry guided them through where they saw this now david and glenda were not the first or the last of terry's followers that would end up dying either in a freak accident or killing themselves or even being beaten to death uh, and leaving their money to Terry. This would be a recurring theme. There was a bunch of people and by a bunch, I mean at least 10. So when David and Glenda's family found out about this and the notebook and how everything was left to Terry and how much she had influenced them, they basically sued Terry. They say that she controlled them through hypnosis and mind control and she pressured them to change their wills and kill themselves. But to understand how we get to this point, we need to go back, okay? Back to when Terry was a little girl because the way she ended up being God to all these people, the story is so... <laughs> Terry was born in 1938 in Fort Worth, no, that's not true, Fort Stockton, Texas. She was born into abject poverty. It is said that she was picking cotton in the hot Texas heat as a little girl. And she had a lot of tragedy in her life. Her younger sister, who she was very excited to meet, was stillborn and her mother was dying of tuberculosis and her dad was an alcoholic. By the age of three and a half, four, she claims to have had her first vision. She said she was under a tree when three men appeared to her. They were wearing glorious robes and they told her, quote, well, this is what she said, I could do anything I wanted if I wanted it badly enough. A few years later, when Terry is nine, her mother is dead, her father's an alcoholic, she ends up at an orphanage. And in this orphanage, she has many religious experiences and teachings from a nun. So first thing that happens is this nun tells her about things that are not traditionally Christian. They're more new age or even occult beliefs. She tells her first about the elements, earth, water, air, fire, ether. She tells her about the Akashic records, which is like a spiritual, I don't, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but my understanding is it's like a spiritual, library or or 
document that talks about everything that ever happened and is ever going to happen in the past, present, future. And some people can access the Akashic records. And then while at this orphanage, Terry has another vision. Those three men in the robes, they appear to her again. And she is then told that she is reincarnated from Saint Teresa, a 16th century nun who also had visions. So she is Saint Teresa. This nun, not the one that she's reincarnated, but the one that was teaching her about this stuff, taught her about karma, reincarnation, taught her about meditation. Two years after she's sent to the orphanage, she gets adopted. So she's 11 years old now. She gets adopted by this couple, but she doesn't stay there for long. By the time she's 15 years old, she ends up running away and getting married. She marries an 18 year old truck driver. Her adoptive mom did not like him. She actually called him quote, a thug, but Terry wanted to be with him. They run away. She ends up getting pregnant. She drops out of high school and she has three kids in total with John. So John is away a lot. He's on the road. He drives a truck and Terry is a stay at home mom. She fills her spare time with reading and studying more things about the occult, but she gets particularly interested in hypnosis and mind control and meditation. She then creates a group of other housewives and they get together and they talk about these topics and she slowly emerges as the leader of this group. And then over time she becomes a teacher and then like a guru and they really start to revere her. This is when Terry decides to create conscious development for the body, mind, and soul. Terry called it an organization, but everyone else called it a cult. You see, Terry was really good at advising, <clears throat> voice crack, advising people. She would also lead them into these trance-like meditations. Some people would say that she hypnotize people while saying it was like a meditation. She would hypnotize them and suggest things to them. Basically, she would try to control every aspect of their lives. Remember when I told you she was a little girl and these three men in robes came to her in visions? Those were three of the 12 masters. Now, these masters included the prophets and religious figures that we all know, like Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, Moses, Baha'i'llah, uh, someone called Marcus. She wouldn't say, I think you should do this. She would be like, mm, Master Marcus or Jesus told me that you should blah, 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 blah. And they'd be like, oh my God, just Jesus said that I'm going to do it. You know, it was like that. She also was really, really against negative thinking. She felt like negative thoughts could create bacteria and viruses. It could even cause cancer. Now it's the 1960s and Terry has a substantial following. She has hundreds of followers in Dallas locally, and she also has thousands of followers word, worldwide, worldwide. This is when she starts her business, CD Gems Inc. It stands for Conscious Development Gems Inc. And it's a jewelry business, but it's not just any jewelry business, it's magical jewelry. This is jewelry that she charges with her energy to protect you. And she said though, the more expensive the jewelry, the more powerful it was. Man, she's good, she's good. She had a lot of supporters, but her husband was not one of them. Remember the truck driver, John? Yeah, he was skeptical. He didn't believe in her powers. He felt like this was a whole scam. She decides to divorce him. She divorces him in 1970 and she tells him that he is quote, impeding her spiritual growth. So he's gotta go. Who does she marry very shortly after? One of her followers. His name is Glenn Cooley. He would also end up dead. Now he was younger than her. He was 20 and she was 33 and he was very, uh, he revered her. He believed in her. He was very faithful. So he becomes her like right hand man. And now she's like all in with the cult and the divorce proceedings, however, are actually kind of a problem because she ends up getting committed. She gets committed to a mental institution and she also loses custody of her two youngest kids. So that doesn't stop her though. Now she's like all in, she gets out, she goes even harder. She's got all these followers. And then this is when people start dying. 
This is where she says there are enemies on the other side on a spiritual plane called the Black Lords. And they, her followers, they're the White Brotherhood. Okay? And so she creates these battles. Okay? They have this ritual. They create a circle. And she gives them spiritual weapons. Their car antennas and cocktail swizzle sticks. And they're sitting there fighting with the car antenna, the Black Lords. Then she tells them, you got to protect yourself. you got to wear robes and jewelry, the fancy jewelry that she sells. Yeah, you have to buy these ju this, the jewelry. The more, the better. So now there's people with layers of, uh, like this, right? Layers of bracelets, layers of necklaces, a bunch of rings with car antennas, and they're fighting the Black Lords. Meanwhile, they're just in a room waving these things around. She would be like, oh, I am checking the records, the, the Akashic records. I'm checking the records. We killed 35 black lords today. This was a good one, but more are coming in. We'll meet me next week and we'll resume battle. People believe this. They were like actually coming back and doing this weird stuff. Her second husband, Glenn, he decides um, he doesn't want to be a part of this anymore because not only is this bizarre stuff going on, but Terry is extremely jealous and possessive of Glenn. According to Glenn's parents, when he would go visit them, if he was there for longer than half an hour, she would start calling the house phone, like blowing it up, calling repeatedly. And then when he would pick up, she would be like, come home now, come home now. And if he didn't, she would pull up to his parents' house and start blaring the horn until he would come out. Like, crazy, right? So he decides he wants out. He wants out of the marriage. He wants out of the cult. And what ends up happening? Well, Terry, she files for divorce. Five days after the divorce is finalized, Glenn turns up dead. Who finds his body? Who do you think? Terry. And boy, does she have a story to tell. Quote, she told the investigators that she found a note in her safe on February 2nd, apparently left there by Glenn the day before. It read, I, Glenn Cooley, give to Terry Cooley, all of my property, both personal and real. This includes two boats, a 1972 Buick Limited, all jewelry and equipment for its making, all furnishings for the house on Dunhaven Road, and all cash. I ask that this last will of mine not be contested by anyone in any way for any reason. Last but not least, I give all my love to all my family and friends. As explanation for all this, I can't really say what it is because of, but I can say what it is not because of. It is not because of divorce with Terry, past drug experiences, inability to cope, etc. What it is, I myself know, but don't have the words for. So according to Terry, she finds this note in her safe. She knows that Glenn was at his family's cabin. So she goes to the cabin. When she gets to the cabin, she finds that Glenn is dead, he's in bed, he's got foam coming from his mouth, there's a half-empty bottle of Coors beer and pills everywhere, and the autopsy rules uh, suicide by overdose, and that's that. But Glenn's mom said that Terry was acting very strange at the funeral. This is a quote from Terry's, I mean, sorry, Glenn's mom. It says, Terry was crying and talking, and then she would stop and look up at me to see my reaction. I didn't understand it. So Terry's story would hold up for 13 years until an ex-member came forward and told a different story. This ex-member said that actually they went to the cabin before Glenn died. And on the way to the cabin, Terry said, quote, Glenn was going to the next level. And that when they arrived at the cabin, Glenn was still alive. He was lucid. He told them that he had taken the pills and then he died. So what does that exactly mean? Did he take them at Terry's direction? Did Terry know this was going to happen? Did she encourage it to happen? Now, before this admission, Terry got away with it. And she explained to her cult members that the reason why Glenn died was because of the Black Lords, that they had poisoned his blood. They put the drugs in his blood, but she had a solution, bloodletting. She would then tell members of her cult that they had poisoned blood 
the black lords poison their blood and they need to give blood, a vial's worth of blood. Some of the cult members, this was the last straw for them. They were like, you know what? We're out. <laughs> we're not going to do that. But then some of them stayed. Okay. One of the most faithful followers was Sandy Cleaver. She would also end up dead. Not just she, her housekeeper and her daughter. And the way her daughter died is particularly disturbing because uh, let me just, okay. So I need to come down. Much like the other members of the cult, Sandy was very wealthy. Her family had the successful business, she had a trust fund, and she was one of the major funders of Terry's cult. She gave her so much money, jewelry, that expensive jewelry that Terry was selling. Sandy bought it and gave it to her. Sandy herself would cut was like dripping in jewels. She would even shower in layers of necklaces, bracelets, and like at least 14 rings because she was always trying to be protected from the Black Lords. Sandy followed Terry blindly and Terry in return told her, you are a former high priestess of Atlantis. You're not just Sandy Cleaver. You're going to help me in this battle against the Black Lords. We're going to save humanity. And pretty much anything that Terry did, Sandy did too. When Terry divorced her husband and said, you're impeding my spiritual growth, Sandy did the same thing. She divorced her husband, Chuck, and told him, you are impeding my spiritual growth. Now, the thing with Sandy is that she neglected her daughter. Her daughter is Devereaux, the one that would die in this freak accident, or maybe she was killed. We don't know, but she neglected her. I mean, she would leave her with the housekeeper who also died. Her name was Louise, but they called her Wheezy. So she would leave Devereaux with Wheezy for days at a time. And the whole time she was with Terry at Terry's fighting the Black Lords. Not only was she gone all the time and doing all these things, but she refused to treat Devereaux with traditional medicine when Devereaux got sick. Like one time she had scarlet fever and instead of taking her to the hospital, she wanted to just light incense and pray over her. And the father had to take her at like 5 a.m. to the hospital to get her treatment. And she would give Devereaux, according to Chuck, 100 pills a day at, at times. And then he took the pills and got them tested and they were just placebos. But then one time they got into this fight and Chuck says, Sandy said, quote, sometimes I think Devereaux would be better off in heaven. During the divorce, Chuck really is fighting for custody of Devereaux because of everything I just told you. But he ends up making a decision that would haunt him. And he says that he believes he could have gotten full custody, but, and this is a bit strange, he said he felt like if he got full custody, that Sandy would kill Devereaux rather than let her be with him all the time. So he, settled for joint custody which is weird because if you it i don't know but that's what he said this is when things get even worse because terry okay starts telling sandy that Devereaux is dark the black lords have gotten to her okay why because Devereaux thinks that everything that terry and the cult are doing is weird she felt that it was weird she was embarrassed by it if her friends came around and her mom was doing something that Terry told her to do, she would be like, don't get weirded out. This is weird. And she was actually fighting with her mom. There is a letter that she wrote her friend and it says, quote, sorry, I couldn't talk to you last night, but my mom had a fit at me. She was bitching me out when you called the first time and I yelled, my mom is sick and that did it. She got up and tried to slap me, but it was hilarious because I'm bigger than she is and I wouldn't let her. Well, a few months after this letter, Devereaux would end up dead. The whole thing was really weird, let me tell you. So Sandy, remember I told you, she was always neglecting Devereaux. And so when her mom invited her on a trip to Hawaii that usually she would have taken without her, Devereaux was happy. She was like, yes, I'll come, thank you so much. Like she was so excited. She ends up dying in Hawaii. What happened was they were on this blue inflatable raft, Sandy and Devereaux. And the waves in the water were really crazy. One of the waves ends up knocking them off the raft. Then, this is all according to Sandy, another wave separates them. And Sandy is looking for Devereaux and calling for her and screaming and she can't find her. One of the people on this trip was Sandy's fiance. He was a cult member too. She was about to marry him. He hears the screaming. He ends up calling 
911. They come, they search, they're looking for Devereaux, they can't find her. In the meantime, they take Sandy to the hospital. Terry, Terry, the cult leader, she is the one who calls Chuck. It's 1 a.m. Dallas time. She calls him and she tells him what happened. He freaks out, hops on a plane, and is on his way to Hawaii. While he's in the air, two cult members call his home and inform the people who answer the phone that they have Devereaux's will. It's like, dude, chill. She's missing. Like, they haven't even found out that she's dead yet, and they're already like, we have her will. Before this incident happened, Sandy and Devereaux both wrote wills, and guess who they left everything to? Terry. Devereaux is found, but unfortunately, she's dead. And Sandy is supposedly devastated. Chuck says when he arrives at the hospital, Sandy seemed normal. Her reaction seemed normal. Okay, I want to read you the quote. When we first got there, she was acting like a normal human being, he said. She cried. She said she was sorry about Devereaux. She thanked me for coming to see her. Then, he says, Terry walked into the room and Sandy stopped crying and began saying things such as, Devereaux will be happier in heaven. It was almost like something happened instantly. A glaze came over Sandy's eyes and she became very distant. The will was invalidated because legally a minor cannot write a will in Texas. So Terry never got the money from Devereaux's will. Guess what? Another death. Terry's son has this freak accident and dies right around the time that Devereaux has a freak accident and dies. So her son is Kenneth and he falls from a construction building, like falls and crashes a skull and dies. Now guess who the beneficiary of Kenneth's life insurance policy was? Okay, at this point it's getting boring, right? Because you know who it is. It's Terry. She didn't get money from Devereaux's will, but she made Sandy take out twice the normal amount life insurance on Devereaux, which was $300,000. She did get that. So now she's got all this life insurance money and her and Sandy are bonding over the fact that both of their children died in a freak accident. Sandy, if she was devoted before, she becomes even more devoted now. And she just like gives everything to Terry. She gets to a point. She signs her home over to Terry. Terry moves in and she, Sandy, pays Terry to live in her own house. Imagine, I'm in my house here, my house. You come in here and I pay you rent for me to stay in my house. Oh, hell no. <laughs> oh my God. It could never be me. It could never be. Just to, just to give you an idea of how devoted and mind fucked Sandy is. Again, I'm voice cracking. Now it's 1981. And remember the housekeeper, Wheezy, how she died too, how Sandy would end up dead too. So before they both die, they both rewrote their wills. On September 8th, 1981, Sandy and Wheezy go on a road trip. Now, Wheezy did not want to go. The housekeeper, she was so against it. Her intuition was screaming. But everyone says that she was very loyal to Sandy, did anything Sandy asked her to do. And so she went on the road trip. Well, <laughs> on the road trip, when they're both in the rent -a car Sandy drives off a cliff. When police investigate the scene, they find that there are no uh, skid marks. There is no evidence that she veered to try to avoid the cliff or break or any, it just, she drove off the cliff. They both die. And who gets all the money now? Terry. What was also weird was that Terry shows up to identify the bodies and claim them. Their wills are in her hand as she's claiming the body. Damn. Like the bodies are not even cold yet. And she's like, I, I, they, they gave me their money. I want their money. Can I get their money? But the will was contested by who? Sandy's brother. Okay. This would end up being a huge thing. They would end up going to trial. Sandy's brother says, Terry influenced my sister to write a will. She used hypnosis, mind control, quote, Pavlovian conditioning, 
and psychotherapy to get her to write this will. This was written under undue influence and it should be invalidated. Now, guess who testifies at this trial on behalf of Terry? David Goodman. Remember the beginning of the story when I told you David and Glenda Goodman killed themselves? Okay. Well, before that all went down, they were cult members and they testified in Sandy's trial saying that she did this, you know, we can't, we had no control over her. Uh, Terry would never do such a thing. And then he would end up killing himself too. In the end, Terry and Sandy's brother end up settling. They settle and Terry gives him, like they split everything in half. Oh, but it's not over. It's not even close to being over. It would be several more bizarre, strange deaths after this. We need to talk about Robin Oststadt. Is that how you say it? Oststadt. Robin took over Sandy's role after Sandy killed herself. She would also end up dying, okay? Let me tell you what happened. Robin was super, super scared of the Black Lords. I mean, she had like gnomes, little gnomes all around the house that Terry gave her to protect her. She was dripping in the jewelry and, and the whole thing. But there was something else even weirder than that, if you can imagine it. Yes. Okay. So Terry had visions, right? She could speak to the dead. She could speak to the masters. She ends up somehow, I don't know how, convincing Robin that there is an invisible CIA agent that is in love with Robin, that they are together like robin ends up falling in love with an invisible cia agent now the reason why this was believable to robin is that terry said she had cia ties remember you know mk ultra mind control hypnosis all of that so terry is claiming that she works with the cia she trains cia agents in her techniques of hypnosis mind control and all of that so she knows all about the cia stuff and that actually this guy the agent, his name is uh, George Joffrey. He is invisible because of this you know, technology that the CIA has that, that they're not privy to. It's not even the weirdest part. I'm gonna need you to sit down if you're not already sitting because I don't know if you guys are gonna handle it. I almost passed out when I read this. That's being dramatic. I didn't pass out. I just said, Pfft. oh my God. Terry ends up convincing Robin that she has viral herpes. And the weirdest part of it is that she told her that she got it from a banana peel. I swear to God, you guys, I can't make this shit up. She ends up calling her ex-husband and telling him, and he's like, wait, what? Who told you that? And she's like, Terry. And he's like, listen, you need to go to a doctor and actually get a blood test and, and just get a second opinion, okay? Because I don't think you can, that, I don't think that's a thing. So. Have I been saying herpes this whole time? Did I say herpes? I think I might have said herpes. Shit. I'm so sorry if I said herpes. I meant hepatitis. Hepatitis. So eventually she ends up going to this doctor appointment. Goes to the doctor appointment. She gets her blood taken. But what else does she do the same day she goes to the doctor's appointment? She goes to Terry's house. Now we don't know what Terry told her and what happened. All we know is that Robin went from the doctor's appointment to Terry's home, back to her house, and she shot herself in the head. Like, it's not funny at this, like, it's like, oh my God, banana peel. I was reading it and then I got to this point and I was like, fuck. Like, these, these people have mental illness and she is exploiting that. When people found Robin, they found a note. She left a suicide note. And this is what Robin's suicide note said. I am apologizing to Terry 3000 times a week on all levels of my being for the highly offensive, rude and vulgar comments made to her last week. I love her dearly and beg her forgiveness one day. Fucking Terry, man. In the will, it says she bequeathed her Colorado, Colorado land, all her jewelry, writings, and personal files, figurines, clothes, and bedroom furniture to Terry Hoffman. The blood tests came out after she was dead and she didn't have 
hepatitis. Cecil Emerson heads up the DA's investigation of Hoffman, says he believes she is practicing medicine without a license, and that can be dangerous. Would you want a tree surgeon doing open heart surgery on you? As if that wasn't bad enough, there's another person, Charles, Charles Southern. Now, he was an English professor, but he was interested in the Eastern religions, New Age, the metaphysical, and that's how he found out about conscious development and Terry. And he ends up joining the group cult. And his family then find him one day, wandering the street, rambling incoherently. This is what his sister Cheryl said. We found Charles wandering on the street, carrying a newspaper stating, I lived for art. We got him in the car and took him to Michael Reese Hospital for examination, stating that he might be suicidal. And he also seemed to be reciting something in a strange language over and over and over again. So while he was hospitalized, the cult members visited him every day. Then he gets out and he tells his family he's going to India for two weeks and he doesn't want anything to do with the cult. Well, two weeks come and go and they haven't heard from him. So they end up going to his home and they end up breaking down the door. And when they go in there, they find his passport is there, but there are no entry stamps to India. They also find his clothes neatly folded on quote, ceremonial stool. They also find a letter with like, it looked like it was scrawled. It was barely legible and it read Terry Hoffman, was executor of his estate. Whoa, I meant to say executor? That is embarrassing. And then one part of it said, I came under a bad influence and I was trying to fight it myself. Wonder if it was the Black Lords that he felt he came under. Charles was missing and he's still missing. He's never been found. He could be dead. He could have killed himself. Maybe they killed him and got rid of the body because he didn't want to kill himself. Maybe he's in hiding and uh, we don't know. We don't know where he is. There was even an episode of Unsolved Mysteries about him and his disappearance. And if, I don't know, I don't know. Unfortunately, there's more. The next person who died was Terry Hoffman's fourth husband, Don Hoffman. Their marriage was scandalous because Don Hoffman and his wife, Alice Hoffman, joined the cult. And then all of a sudden, uh, Terry divorces her third husband. And somehow, some way, Alice writes that she gives permission for Terry to marry Don. They end up divorcing. Alice ends up quitting the cult, leaves for obvious reasons. And Don and Terry get married. And Don quits his job and he becomes her right-hand man. He ends up dead as well. In this tape, he made himself just before committing suicide. He describes his agonizing pain from cancer. I'm not really afraid of death. I came to terms with it many years ago. Just after his death, Terry Hoffman told Richard's children over the phone that she had met with Richard and that he apologized for killing himself, but had no other choice. He cried, and, and he said he's free of pain for the first time in, in over a year now, and, and, uh, and he, he said he just, he, just, he just had to do what he had to do. There is a diary entry from another cult member, and it talks about Don and Terry's relationship, and it's not good. It says, Sunday, June 19th. This, by the way, was in 1988. Sunday, June 19th, day of justice for all. Terry comes over and takes a new pill with us. Dawn has lowered her consciousness. God infuriates David, another follower, over Dawn's poor treatment of Terry. David asks God to bring justice to Dawn, not to send bad karma, to send just karma that he deserves. So around this time, Dawn starts complaining of a variety of ailments. And just like Robin, who was convinced she had hepatitis, Dawn is now convinced that he has cancer. Terminal, inoperable cancer. He ends up committing suicide by overdose. 
and he leaves a suicide note and also video. So in his suicide note, he wrote, I have terminal inoperable cancer and I refuse to go through chemotherapy just to gain a few more months of living. I really wouldn't be living anyway, just taking too long to die. In the video, he claims that he went to three different doctors and he got this diagnosis and that it's just not worth it for him anymore. He's gonna kill himself. Just like with Robin, his body was tested after his death and the autopsy revealed he didn't have cancer. Just like Robin, he left everything to Terry. Don's son is pissed, very pissed. He ends up suing Terry for wrongful death. He claims that she used mind control, hypnosis, and other techniques of manipulation to convince his father that he had cancer and to kill himself so that she could get all the money. Terry then tells Don's son, you don't understand, man. You don't get it. The Black Lords are behind all of this. They created an illusion and shielded the cancer from the medical examiner when he performed the autopsy. He did have cancer. It's just that the Black Lords are so powerful. This is what we're fighting against. Now, here's a really weird thing that happened. Four days after Don's suicide, another cult member dies, but this time, not by suicide. It's a brutal murder. And the whole thing was really strange. It was just four days after Don's suicide. The victim was Jill Bounds, and she was a therapist and a follower of Terry's. Now, her body was discovered by her friend. Her friend noticed several things that were off as soon as she got there. First, the newspaper, remember those actual newspapers, uh, was out on the front lawn. And it was odd because for that time of day, Jill would have brought it into the house and then she went to knock on the door. No one was answering and she was getting concerned. She eventually looks through one of the windows and she sees papers and things scattered like, like someone had rifled through the home. So she freaks out. She ends up calling the cops. When they come in, they find Jill dead. She's in her bed. It looks like somebody had bashed her skull in while she was sleeping. There were no signs of forced entry. Whoever it was that did this, okay either was someone she would let into her home in the middle of the night or someone who had her keys and her security code and there were five people who had her keys and security code when the people who knew jill found out that someone brutally murdered her it was shocking but they were not shocked why because although she was a therapist and professionally she seemed like she had it all together they all said that her personal life was messy she first of all she was obsessed with extreme alternative medicine like she would do things like drink dog's milk and snake venom okay for health purposes and then also her relationships with men were tumultuous to say the least. She would manipulate men and she would laugh about it. She would tell them stories about how she would accuse some guy she was seeing of cheating and guilt trip him into buying her a nice dress or fancy jewelry and then she would laugh about it. She also had violent rages and there were five people who had her key and security code. Two of them, one was her neighbor Bernadette, the other one was her made Essie and the other three were men in her life. One of those men was Adam Schubert. They had a crazy relationship. It was very quick and they were talking about marriage very quickly, but she was super jealous. And if he was late, she would like literally hit him and he ends up leaving and whatever. But he's a suspect because he has access to her home. The other person is a guy named Bob Jones. Now this guy, she friend zoned. He was always around on the sidelines, always lingering, okay, uh, hoping maybe to get in one day. And she was supposed to see him that day, but she canceled on him to have a rendezvous with the third guy who had a key and security code known as Bob Hargrove, but she, he's referred to as BH, and I'm going to call him BH because there's two Bobs. Bob Jones, friend zone, and then BH, rendezvous guy. The day she was killed, started like any other day okay she did her usual routine she had a journal she wrote everything in her journal but something strange happened later in the day that she wrote about in her journal okay it says quote bh found me in the park a lot of people were suspecting 
B.H. or Bob? Which one was it? Well, turns out that Bob had connections to Terry Hoffman. And it turns out that Jill also had connections to Terry Hoffman. She had actually recently spoken to Terry. She was a devout follower of Terry. She told her friends that she was Terry's right hand. But at some point, she decides to leave the cult. And Terry's very angry with her. Terry sent cockroaches to her home to try to get it infested with roaches. So people started thinking, wait a minute, could it be Terry with Bob? Two strange things happened the day after her body was found. When her mom went back to her home after the police had searched it and everything, she found a strange drawing outside of the home. And I'll read you the quote. It says, in colored marker, it showed the letter J, a bunch of grapes, a symbol for Omega, the last letter in the Greek alphabet, and a penis surrounded by several lightning bolts, often called the satanic S. Nearby was a red toy robot, its legs pulled off and head crushed in. And then Bob Jones goes to her family business because just like all the other members, right? Jill is from a wealthy family. He tells the, rece the receptionist, quote, today is my birthday and look what I get an effing card on my birthday. And he had a, a card, a birthday card that Jill had given him. Bob Jones also told Jill's mom that he asked her, did you know that I was, I'm was i the beneficiary of her policy? Now this is a very Terry-like thing. And then he was interviewed, okay, for this story about Jill's death and in the interview, it was, there was something I want to read you that I found very strange, okay? It says here, quote, He seems to think back to the day of her death. He begins crying softly. I believe we choose what happens to us. On some level, she chose that, he says, wiping his eyes. I just keep thinking that if she had gone to lunch with me that day, she wouldn't have been killed. So did Bob kill Jill? And if he did, did he kill her? Oh, oh, I forgot to tell you something. Oh, my God. When they found her body, there were pages ripped out of her journal. Okay, so there was that drawing, that weird occult drawing, and pages were ripped out of her journal. And then this thing happened. So, so people were trying to say that Bob did it, but did he do it alone? Was Terry somehow involved in this? Okay, so we'll talk about all that in the theories. I need to get to the next person because another person died. <sighs> this is the last person, Mary. Levinson. Mary and Terry's relationship consisted mostly of phone consultations because Mary was in Chicago and Terry was in Dallas. But Mary was very secretive about these phone conversations. At one time, she even left her mom to stand outside of her apartment while she stayed on the phone for an hour talking to Terry. Imagine leaving your mom outside for an hour while you're talking to someone just because, I don't know, whatever. The thing with Mary is she was already suicidal. She had made several attempts before, but they were never like full on attempts. She would tell the people in her life that she was going to do it, would give them a chance to stop it. You know, she would maybe take something or say she was going to take something. They would come and save her and it wouldn't happen. So she she talked about it a lot. She thought about it a lot, but she never actually did it until she started talking to Terry. So when Mary was found dead, she was found in a motel and she was surrounded by boxes of Benadryl, like open boxes of Benadryl and other pills. But the autopsy also revealed that there was a needle puncture in her left wrist. She told her family that she had a $125,000 divorce settlement and that she did something with it, but she doesn't want anyone to know what she did with it. She was super secretive about it. And everyone pretty much thinks she gave it to Terry, but that Terry didn't want anyone to know because she was already getting sued by all these people. In 1991, she files for bankruptcy. Her filing for bankruptcy if effectively like throws a wrench in all these suits against her and she's trying to like get away from it. But then in 1993, she's convicted of bankruptcy fraud. She is uh, convicted of basically hiding accounts, lying about 
money that she claims she didn't have that she did have and then also she had the power of attorney to control all her boyfriend's bank accounts she didn't tell the court that either so they end up convicting her they she only does a year though because she appeals and wins the appeal for insufficient evidence and is acquitted and released so she only did one year and conscious development dies but she rebrands okay in 2005 she was she had a new grift okay what was she doing she was selling photos that she took of clouds and things online i'll show you some of them they're really wonderful she called herself a visionary cloud artist and these pictures were angel photographs that she sold she also claimed to have pictures of mystical creatures such as mermaids and ghost riders surf riders something ghost surfers something and she finally died halloween 2015 okay finally in her obituary it says here quote so our leader has left us on the physio astral but nevertheless still exists on all the other levels until we meet again. So those are the facts. Now let's discuss the theories. Did she actually mind control these people, or, you know, and like control their minds and hypnotize them and make them do this? Or were these people mentally unstable or probably gonna do it anyway? What about Jill? Because Jill's death, the one where she was uh, murdered, this doesn't fit all the other MOs where it's either like a freak accident or a suicide this one was just a brutal murder like did was it just a coincidence that she was linked to linked to terry or was terry involved about charles southern who went missing right that also is a little bit different so let's begin with whether terry is responsible now the prosecutor she never faced any criminal charges for these deaths because the prosecutor said although he believed that she really did hypnotize them he didn't feel like it would hold up in court. So why is that, right? Do we believe in hypnosis? Do you guys believe in mind control, hypnosis, in trance-like state, and in influencing people, getting them to the point where they do this? You know, what about the her making them think they had these terminal illnesses, right? Was it up to them to actually get a second opinion? Like some of these people, the things they would believe, like I don't, I don't know, I don't feel like someone could do that to me, but just because. I don't feel like it would work on me. Does it mean that someone else shouldn't be protected from someone like that? I don't know. Is that a moral thing, a philosophical thing? I'm not sure. The thing is, um, many people believe hypnosis is real. Like personal story, I haven't done hypnosis, but I know someone who got hypnosis for like smoking. I know someone else who got it for sugar. And the thing is, the person who got it for smoking, they never smoked cigarettes after that. It's been years and years and years. But the person I know who got hypnosis for sugar, they had like a sugar addiction, if you will, they're still eating sugar. So I don't know. I don't know. So that's like a little, like that wasn't very helpful. Um, the other thing too is some of these people, were they already going to do it? Like Mary, she was already suicidal. Can you blame someone for that? And then the whole thing about them leaving their money to Terry, uh, her attorney, when asked about this, said, you know, nobody questions it when someone is attending a church and they're really, you know, loyal members of that church. And then when they die, they leave some of their money to the church. But because this is alternative, you guys are saying it's a cult and it's messed up and this and that. What's the difference? So that's an argument, too. Now, regarding um, Jill. This one, I don't know how I feel about it because I could very well see Bob doing this on his own. Did he and Terry conspire together to split maybe the money and he maybe Terry was in his ear already because he was a member too and she was trying to turn him against her, but it didn't work until he felt betrayed by her because she canceled on his birthday lunch and then she just sent him a card and he was mad about it. And then he had that thing where he cried and was like, I just feel like she chose this. If she would have had lunch with me, this wouldn't have happened. That's weird. Like, what are you saying there? Like if she, if she would have just, you know, went to lunch with you, you wouldn't have killed her. 
you know it seems like that's kind of what he was implying i get my, like my conspiracy so and the thing with charles southern the one who went missing makes me wonder did he go missing because he didn't want to kill himself and they end up killing him and tried to hide the body but then why wouldn't they do that with jill hmm because with Jill, there was that strange drawing. With Charles, there was that letter and the ceremonial aspect to it. What was that, what, you know? That's the thing. If you tried to leave, Terry would get really upset. Remember, Jill said Terry sent cockroaches. There was that strange drawing. Charles' family said he was trying to leave when he was hospitalized. That's why they kept coming to him. Maybe he tried to leave and they were like, no. I don't know. A lot of mysteries, and, and I mean, she, she got away with it. She died, she never faced justice, she got away with it. Some people think she was like a suicide serial killer, I don't know. I mean, the, the question really rests, if someone kills themselves with their own hands, right? It's not like someone puts a gun to you and tells you shoot yourself, you, they might not even be in the room. Can you blame someone else for that? That's the real root of everything. And if you bring in things like cults, mind control, hypnosis, manipulation, how does that factor into it? Very interesting. I would love to know what you guys think. Please let me know. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.